Hey everyone, this is Sri. I'm one of the founders and CEO of Rocket Lane. एक मिनट रुक जाओ, ready होने दो. चलो, ये कर लेते हैं. This could be a great intro. Sri Krishna Ganeshan has had one of the most impressive journeys you would ever find in a founder. He is an engineer who did his MBA from IIM Bangalore. After working in product management roles at Verizon and Rediff, he started his first entrepreneurial venture that got acquired by the Nasdaq listed Freshworks. At Freshworks, he learned about building SaaS products for scale and that learning culminated in the launch of his second startup, Rocket Lane. Rocket Lane has raised 21 million dollars till date from top tier VCs and it operates in the fast growing vertical SaaS space. This episode is a masterclass in building and scaling up a SaaS business, and here's Sri Krishnan telling Akshay about how it all started. I had a professor, professor who was a product manager at Adobe, like a visiting prof. So those influences definitely led me to think this is what I want to do, which is pretty cutting edge for its time. Like for them to actually have Google and Adobe product managers take lectures. Definitely, I think there were hardly any PM jobs on offer on campus, to be honest. So it was like. It, it showed me what it could be, but then there weren't necessarily those roles available on campus. So there were probably two companies who came. I didn't get into those companies, and I was I started looking outside for like, how can I get myself into this domain? Because I didn't have prior work ex. It was slightly harder as well. Yeah, yeah. So where did you land then? So I went to Verizon. So a friend of mine was working on the engineering side at Verizon. This friend now happens to be my co-founder. And he had mentioned once that hey, there is this guy from I am Cal, who does product management over here in, in India only. In India, yeah, he was the only PM in India with Verizon. So I was like, okay, then why can't you help me get that role? And he was like, don't know. I asked around. I don't see an option. But I bugged him enough that he got me a conversation with his director in IT. And I spoke to him, and he said, hey, I can't give you a PM role, but. Maybe I'll offer you a business analyst role where you interface with PMs, and if there is an opportunity, I'll be okay with you moving to that function. And the good thing was, in three months, the opportunity came where, like, this person I was working with from the product manager side basically said, "Hey, do you have any other friends like you who can join our team?" I said, "Let's not worry about other friends. I'm the person." <laughs> <laughs> okay okay <laughs> and what did you learn in that stint as a product manager at Verizon so this was for set top box software so very different from what we are used to today but there were a lot of things i learned about right from making a business case for like a new product development initiative we used the stage gate model for like getting approvals on initiatives that all of us had how to champion like a new idea and take it through different stages What is uh, the stage gate model? It's a proper, it's a pretty popular new product development methodology of sorts inside large companies where anyone can come up with a new idea, and then how do you sort of filter through those ideas and take them from idea to next validation of some sorts to a prototype to so on. It can get discarded at any stage. It's gonna go all the way to legal and all of that, and then get to a launch. So that was something that it's a pretty formal methodology for like new product development, and was exposed to that. I was definitely exposed to a lot of dimensions to product management itself. Like, how do you really win the confidence of the team that you're working with? How do you get like the engineers and designers to respect what vision you bring to the table? And how do you sort of work well with them? How do you attract ideas from everyone on the team? Because I'm the first one to believe that I'm not the most creative person. But I like to harness creativity from others around. So that was like an interesting like dynamic that I sort of got better at at Verizon. And then I think there's also elements of like what kind of consistency you need to have when you're thinking about design, thinking about like naming things in a UI. So I had two like one immediate manager who's a director of product management and a VP. So the VP is the person who was giving me a lot more business perspective, where the making the case for something and all of that came into the picture. And this director was the one who was giving me much more like very granular input on how to prioritize things, how to really ensure consistency in the product. how to give feedback to designers the right way and how to work well with cross functional team and all of that so about i guess 2 3 years after your verizon stint you became a founder so tell me about that journey from 
being a PM at Verizon to becoming a founder? Yeah, so I went from a very large company, Verizon. Next, I went to Rediff, right? I spent a year, close to a year at Rediff, which is a 300 member team. But I still felt the larger company, Verizon, had a more, I would say, a culture that was more excited about the products that they were building. So the whole team was more excited about and believed in what they were doing. And from Rediff, I went to a very small startup called Jixi. Rediff had that issue which Yahoo also had. They were not sure if they're a media company or a tech company. That's true. That's true. And I think very often they were trying to catch the next wave and that focus kept shifting a fair bit. So that was like the hard part over there. And frankly, it was not the kind of art where I could see myself stick on more because people around me weren't believing in what I did. And I was used to a certain kind of thing. So I thought maybe a startup is what I should go to next and went to the startup called Jixi. I was heading product for them pretty much. So think of this as like YouTube for the masses where back then feature phones were popular. So like you have these Nokia and Samsung and Sony Ericsson Java phones. And YouTube doesn't run on those devices. So our Java app would allow people to stream long form video like movies on 2G networks. That was the play. And it was fairly successful as a product. Had like 6 million downloads in the first six months. I was super excited to make all that happen over there because I pretty much built the team. I felt like I was pretty much running a team over there. I had that strong sense of ownership and it was my identity for those two and a half years I was there. And in a way, I think that's the stint that also gave me this confidence that, hey, I can go out and do something on my own. You need to be like slightly irrational and overestimate, overconfidence is needed to go and start something. And that happened from the Jixi stint for me. Jixi workout, like both for you and as a business. Well, we weren't making much money as a company because we were still, our users were like local next street watchman would be watching long form video on this, but he's not going to be able to pay for it. He's already paying like five rupees a day for his internet or whatever. And that's how much he's going to afford. We did turn it into a B2B business with folks like Disney, Reliance and Sony as customers. But I think we weren't charging them enough. They were actually making more money than us of it in whatever way. And the company got acquired by Viewclip in 2012 end. And Viewclip eventually made that business successful and large. More so, I would say in Southeast Asia, they like took it more global as well. But I didn't stick around, right? So I sort of said, hey, I'm sort of, I have this confidence that I can do something on my own and I have an idea and two friends willing to work with me on that idea. So let me go back to Chennai and start that right away. So irrespective of how Jixi was doing, I think I would have done this anyway because that bug sort of bit me by then. And I thought it was easy. (laughs) What was the idea that inspired you to quit a job and become a founder? Yeah, so the original idea we started working on was voice messaging app. So think of WhatsApp back in 2012, they didn't have any voice messaging feature. And we were like, hey, WhatsApp is sort of lame. It's like very plain. We're going to make a much more fun version for today. And it's going to have voice and that's really taken off and like, Korea and China and Japan are all about voice messaging and maybe India will be too. So that was the idea. And there were a lot of these chat startups. Hike was also, I think, coming up around that time. And Vine was advertising on TV. I remember seeing their ads on TV, which was fairly surprising. Correct. So you had uh, Parniti Chopra for WeChat, Katrina Kaif for Line. And we figured that it's going to be hard to compete with all of them. We started immediately. We had... Hike launch, one month later, you had the chat, the next month line. And the month after that, WhatsApp launched voice messaging. And that was like when we said, okay, wait, let's reassess what we're doing. But we had a beautiful pivot at that point where we said, hey, messaging is what we really believe in. We have built like beautiful messaging for like people to chat with each other. But what if we can make this happen between a person and a business? So we changed it into an SDK that went into other people's apps. So we have used the chat and Zomato and Swiggy and Big Basket, Bank Bazaar. All of that was powered by us. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Got it, got it. So like a early version of chatbots or what today say Yellow AI is offering. Hmm. Correct. Exactly. So it wasn't chatbots back then. It was all human powered, but messaging as a medium, we were like really championing that to bring it to every app out there. So was it making money? Like in Jixi, you felt that you were not charging customers enough. Did you like 
fix that problem here? How did it go? Yeah, we, we had a fair number of customers who weren't paying us yet, but we also had a fair number of customers who were paying us decent money. And we also had a couple of like larger customers. One of them was in the US. We actually paid tax as a startup in our third year of operation. We were making money, not loads of money, but there was potential. You were um, cash flow positive, basically. Yeah, we were cash flow positive. Yeah, and this was bootstrap. You didn't raise any external funds. Yeah, we, we did win some prize money from Axel and Qualcomm. That was a convertible note through a contest, but we didn't turn it into equity. And other than that, for the most part, we were bootstrap. Hmm. Okay. So then what happened? Like, why didn't you just continue building that only? Yeah. So we actually had put together like an angel round to take things forward with more firepower. And at that time, there was inbound interest, another company to acquire us. One thing led to the other. We first sort of dismissed it because even before that, most companies that we engaged with used to say, hey, can we acquire your product and company? Because we were a small team. We were just three of us for like the first two and a half years. And people loved the idea. So every customer was like potentially talking to us about, hey, can we acquire yeah. yeah. And we want to make this code to our business and all of that, right? Engagement is important. And we said no, because most of them we knew would like throw very small acquihire offers at us. So here as well, we said no, but then the founder and the investors at their end said, no, it was in a different company. And they were pretty, they said they're very serious about it. And that we should at least listen to what the offer is. And we actually found it to be an interesting enough offer for us because we were bootstrapped. We hadn't taken any external money that we needed to return. It was an interesting proposition. And then Freshworks also came into the picture and then it became a no brainer for us. If Freshworks is going to max that offer, and we've heard so many great things about how fast Freshworks is growing. So it's like real money. It's not like paper money. So let's go okay. and do this. Okay. They, um, they were offering a cash buyout. No, but we knew that. I mean, there was cash involved, but, uh, but equity we, was we, worth more. Uh. We knew Freshworks equity is at least what it was then. We didn't expect it to grow as much as it did now, but we believe it was real. Did you hold on to it till IPO? Yeah, yeah. We still have it. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So then what, like you joined Freshworks? What's the journey after that? Yes. So we sort of uh, joined Freshworks early enough in the Freshworks journey, 2015. And Dresh and team basically gave us the freedom to build, continue building that business. There was another team doing similar things in Freshworks. So they sort of joined, we put the two teams together and really went after this mobile messaging in a big way. But I would say it was still chunky growth. It was still not like the kind of momentum that the rest of Freshworks had, which was an eye opener to us. When we saw how things work inside, we were like, oh, wow. And... Obviously, we wanted that too. We were like one of the hardest working teams inside the company, but we didn't have the same results to show as the others. And one thing that happened was at an event, like me and Girish were at this event where Shekhar Kirani, investor at Axel, he was actually talking at this event about how a rising tide lifts all boats. And at that moment, we sort of looked at each other at a break in that session and said, hey, are we in a rising tide or not? And like, we knew the answer, we were not because there weren't other players who were growing fast in that market. Whereas in web chat, which like has existed forever, there was a new company in the com that had grown from 1 million to 50 million in three years. So we were like, okay, maybe we just need to make some adjustment here and say, okay, let's go after web as well, not just mobile messaging. That one change we made, like we decided in late 2016. 2017, we relaunched as Fresh Chat with web and mobile, became the fastest product in Freshworks to reach various revenue milestones. So it really changed the trajectory, it became like an awesome growth story for us. It was very rewarding to see what it did for everyone on our team as well. So everyone naturally was pushed to grow and level up in different ways because the business was growing. So th this was like the chat pop-up, which comes when you visit a website where like, say you go to a, a net tech website and there'll be a chat pop-up, like, can I help you understand which course you're looking for? And then you start chatting and there could be a human or it could be a bot. So you probably built the human version of that. That's correct. We did 
when we launch, relaunched Freshware, it did add some bot elements because Freshworks had also acquired a bot company at that time. So we integrated that as well into the system. That's what it was. Got it. And obviously it made sense for Freshworks because their customers are coming to them for customer engagement solutions. And this is an important piece of the bouquet that they would be able to offer. Absolutely. It was already important, but it also started delivering on that promise in 2017. And since then, it's become like one of their most important products that they're investing in. Mm, okay. So you were leading Fresh Chat till I think close to end of 2019, right? So what happened then? Yeah, we spent four and a half years at Freshworks. December 31st, 2019 was actually our last day over there. But we had planned to move out from like mid-2019. We had made that decision and we worked with Girish and like the senior leadership there to do like a smooth transition over a period of time. Because we knew we had one more startup in us. And after having seen what growth does for you and the team, we really wanted to try it on our own. So we had we'd seen that journey inside Freshworks now. We experienced what momentum can mean for everyone. And we wanted to make that happen. Okay. Did you have a clear idea in mind that what is it you want to build? Or you thought you'll figure it out after quitting? We had a few ideas. We hadn't like necessarily validated them, but we knew, hey, these are very clear pain points. Then we started, once we got out, we started like talking a lot more about which one we want to like go after, which one's going to have the right momentum behind it and started validating, talking to people from different companies who were in those roles and fairly quickly settled on the current idea, which is really about a purpose-built software for customer onboarding and implementation teams, because we'd faced it firsthand at Freshworks as well, the problems around customer onboarding and implementation. Help me understand what, what was the problem you saw that convinced you that this is what you should go after? Right. So whenever we were selling to like mid-market or enterprise customers, you'll finish the sale, but to go live with the customer was like a real headache and so much chaos. So they were always like, there's some sort of finger pointing back and forth, delays, and it was never like a happy journey, though this was probably the most crucial part of making the customer successful with your product. This was the most crucial part where you either build or destroy trust with the customer. And we could see what happens if you, like, I was personally involved in some of these uh, onboarding, some of our like largest early customers for Fresh Chat. And when I was super proactive about it and involved myself and ensured things happened perfectly, the trust and how things went forward with that customer was very different from if I dropped the ball somewhere, let others handle it. And if the playbook wasn't followed, something went wrong then it was escalations forever, right? So I've never used Fresh Chat myself. I'm just imagining software which I've used, like say Canva. So I, I don't understand what is that onboarding problem that you're talking about. Sure, let me explain. Give me an example. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so you, when you talk about Fresh Chat, for a SM, they take one line of JS, add it to their website, they're live. But for a typical mid-market or enterprise customer, your software needs to solve specific problems for them and it needs to work well with their rest of their ecosystem, right? So essentially that means you first need to get on a kickoff call with the customer saying, hey, this is what we understand are your goals. Is our understanding right? And this is how over the next four weeks, they're going to make you successful with our product. And then there is a phase of their developers sort of integrating your product into their website, into their app in larger customers that will involve like authentication because when someone is using the product, you don't want to ask them who you are. The product should know. You want to set so up the right box. It should talk to, talk to their database uh, to Correct. identify customers. Correct. It should identify a customer. It should like full data from their system so that a rep can answer questions without having to dig into other systems. They have all the data they need right there. So it involved building some custom apps, usually building out their, the right bot flows for them and then training their team because some of them had 300 users, 1,000 users. How do we ensure that they all get comfortable and use the product the right way? So there is that whole journey to set them up with the right integrations, migrate some data needed, 
push data into other systems that they have, uh, train the team, ensure adoption is happening, help them figure out how to monitor how their teams are doing. So that whole journey, right? So you used to happen over like spreadsheets and emails and Slack conversations and so on, which meant siloed information in different places, which meant people dropping the ball on both sides, which meant escalations. And that's the problem we looked at and said, okay, we need a purpose-built software, which is going to combine elements of project management, conversations, document collaboration into one experience. So that we're done with the silos. Everyone has the same view of what's happening. If I, as like a business leader, needs to know what's going right and which projects are not going well, I need a way to quickly see that without asking people. And even when I ask people, usually I get their perspective. But I want to know, how is the customer sentiment around this onboarding as well, right? So some onboarding can take three months. And if I know at the end of one month, the customer is not feeling comfortable or confident about how things are going, I can figure out how to jump in or put someone else on the job to fix their perception, right? So it's a lot about visibility on both sides. It's a lot about unifying all the information in one place. And it's also about helping you surface patterns from how you're doing things, right? If you know that a kickoff is where my customers are rating me poorly, right? They're not doing a good job there. Maybe I need to train the team better on how to do the best kickoff meetings. If my training is not well received, maybe I need to change up something over there. So you also have this element of feedback from the customer coming in through. How big is this, like the total addressable market for something like this? Because more and more companies would try and build products which are idiot proof, plug and play, where you don't necessarily need a complex onboarding. They would want to aspire to build their products like that. Each new startup who would like, so say Salesforce is what Freshworks in a way disrupted. Now, Salesforce is notoriously complex to adopt and Freshworks disrupted it by making it easier to adopt. Right. Maybe tomorrow someone else will disrupt Freshworks and build something which is even easier to adopt. So help me understand why you thought that this is a big enough market where you will see massive growth. Sure. So uh, two parts to the answer. First is SaaS in itself is growing so much. And yes, there is this PLG sort of motion that gaining popularity, which means you don't need as many salespeople and complex onboarding. What, what, and so what on. is PLG just for it's, the audience? It's product-led growth. So when you look at a product like Freshworks or Slack or Jira, et cetera, your expectation is that people will set it up on their own. They don't need help. If you build a good enough product, then you don't need to market it. You don't need to sell it rather. Correct. You don't need to sell it. You also, the expectation is people will become successful with the product on their own. But the truth is, even if you, when you look at Slack, which is like the biggest example of TLG probably, when Slack sells to a company the size of Freshworks, the 3,000 employees, now much more, but even at 3,000, they needed a playbook to make Slack successful inside Freshworks. Because if you just opened it up with like whoever do whatever, there's no sense of how to organize things as channels, what should be allowed, what should be not allowed, which apps can be installed, which apps should not be installed, should this connect with the SSO or not. So there is like a lot of decisions that IT needs to make. There's a lot of decisions that the company needs to make about how they're going to organize for better communication within functions, across functions, across geographies, etc. And Slack probably has seen what works and what does it, right? For other customers. So they need to bring their playbook, understand the context of this company and truly do a proper onboarding. So in that way, I think when you sell to mid-market or enterprise, you cannot escape onboarding, however simple your product is. That's one part of the story. But the real story to us is what we built, though today we are focusing on onboarding as what our website talks about and what we are championing. There is a much wider, bigger market that we're going after, which is customer-facing projects of all kinds. When you have a vendor and a customer collaborating. So there's like service companies who are doing custom-built Products. So you, not, not just products, it could be a marketing agency, it could be a consulting company, it could be, a, as you said, IT services company. 
whoever it is, if you're working with clients and you want to have a repeatable motion, which you take every client through to deliver your offering, then Rocket Lane automatically becomes 10x better than your Asana or Jira or whatever else. Okay. So like the traditional way in which service agencies onboard a new client, it would be, they would have some sort of a playbook, but it would not be a very formal playbook. It will start with a call and it will depend a lot on the person who's leading the call, if he's aware of the playbook or not. And that person would have to drive that whole process. Like, okay, now we've understood this and let's send them this proposal. And then now let's get the sign off from them. And now let's send them a wireframe of what we want to do or whatever it is. So it would be very human dependent. So you would be able to help a company put it into more like hard coded so that no matter who's the person who's doing the onboarding, they are following that playbook. Correct. The idea is to move from hero driven to system driven, right? So like you usually depend on one hero ensuring the client is happy and things are happening the right way. Over here, like the system makes sure everyone can deliver the same way. And it's not only onboarding in these cases, right? In these service companies, it's actually the delivery of their service itself, yeah, which we are yeah. looking at happening through Rocket Net. In a way, an onboarding team inside a SaaS company is like a services team inside a product company. And you're saying, hey, this is going to work for all services companies. So essentially, this is a post-sales software, like a post-sales SaaS product. Correct. Right, which is fairly like open space. Most companies are looking at pre-sales, how to manage leads and convert leads. Correct. Uh, so there are support systems and there are customer success tools, which do certain jobs well. But... No one manages these initiatives and programs between the two companies in a good way. So no no one was built for that. And that's what we are changing. Right. Got it. Got it. Okay. So I'm assuming then this is something which is for the employees to use. It's not a, like the end client of that company is not really going to use this as an interface, but it's essentially for the in-house employees to use, say the way. You know, my team would use Salesforce, which is they're using Salesforce. The end client doesn't really know that there is Salesforce being used at the back end. Is this what this is? No, this is a collaborative space between the two parties. And that's what really differentiates what we do versus like you, you can create a project on Asana and ensure people do all the steps, right? But Rocket Name is built for client collaboration. So you invite a client into your project. They get full visibility. They don't need to sign up or sign in because we send them a magic link. They click on the link. They come to, let's say, onboard.freshworks.com. It's branded by our customer. So it's their portal. And our customer's customer can actually see where they are in the journey, what tasks are on their plate, what documents they're working on together, what are the minutes of the last meet what conversations are happening what is the pending work like? at times customers have stuff pending on their end because of which delays are happening so that would get flagged to them say some s- signature is pending on a document or stuff like that even inputs like they need to give the report format that they need configured so you know provide the input it's due since last tuesday and it's visible to the leader on the customer side as well for them to like so you're able to hold each other accountable in the journey so that's an important thing the second is your internal and external collaboration happen in the same place now. So you're not trying to find a different place. Everywhere in Rocket Lane, you can say, hey, this particular task, it's not for the customer to see. It's for my internal team. So I can mark some tasks as private, some tasks as shared, some documents as private, some documents as shared. And when I complete certain important milestone in the project, the customer can rate the experience they had with me right through this portal. So it's like brings that element of feedback as well into the system itself. So is this a workflow focused tool or is it a project management tool like Asana? And I want to understand the product better because this is an audio medium. So we can't show a demo of the product. So talk to me about what is it like? Do you create a workflow that this is stage one of onboarding, stage two of onboarding, stage three of onboarding, and then the customer is going through that journey and for each stage you have subtasks and as you check them off, it automatically moves to the next stage. The way it would happen, say in a CRM for sales, where you have say prospecting and 
negotiation and deal signing. Is it like that? Correct. So think of it as bringing together a few elements. One is there is a strong project management aspect. So the way I like to describe it is it's like Asana plus Slack plus Google Docs or Notion, but built for customer facing projects. And what differentiates it is there is a strong templating experience as part of it, where you can say, as you rightly said, this is stage one, this is stage two, here are the tasks, here are the subtasks. So you're going to create that flow. You're going to create a template for the project or multiple templates for different kinds of projects. And then you're going to invite the customer into each of those projects. You get a portfolio view of what's happening across the projects, including the customer sentiment, including like, is it delayed or not? And all of that. How do you get to know customer sentiment? Through that feedback. So when you deliver on a milestone, the customer rates the delivery and gives you that input. So as a leader, you get like the full picture of what's happening across projects. As an individual project owner, what's stuck, who's it stuck on, what needs to happen next. It gives you tools to publish status updates, meeting notes, and all that with, with like great ease. And the customer can also access it without signing up for any tool to see where they are in the journey. They're going to get automatic like notifications and reminders for tasks that are on their plate. So the follow-ups that you need to do are reduced. So it really is trying to streamline that whole journey and put everything, including your kickoff deck and documents you're working on together, all in one experience. Okay. So uh, let's talk more on product only and dig deeper. But one quick question first. A lot of uh, IT service companies use Basecamp for a similar objective, right? As a post-sales tool to manage the project collaboratively with the client. And I've never used Basecamp myself, but for people who have used it, like how would this be different from Basecamp? I would say this is like a much more robust version of Basecamp in a lot of ways. Hmm. So what is Basecamp? It's like Asana on which you can get your customer uh, on it also, or what is like? Basecamp is like a very bare bones task management, document management sort of experience where you can create different projects. You can invite customers to work with you on those projects. And you do have the notion of internal and external over there, which is a good thing, but it's too bare bones to run serious projects. So if it's just a few tasks that you're tracking, you can do that on Basecamp. If you need to have a large project that you're working on, if you need to embed serious documents in it, if you want to templatize those documents, if you want to get visibility into what's happening across projects, have some reporting, have a portfolio view, dashboards, all of that is not possible in Basecamp. Basecamp is typically, I think if you're a small shop, which is working with, let's say, two or three clients, Basecamp is going to work beautifully for you. The minute it gets serious and you have like a larger team, you want to measure how the team is doing and you want to track the progress across projects, your leader wants the right visibility, then, you know, it breaks down. If you like to hear stories of founders, then we have tons of great stories from entrepreneurs who have built billion-dollar businesses. Just search for the Founder Thesis Podcast on any audio streaming app like Spotify, Ghana, Apple Podcasts, and subscribe to the show. Okay, got it. So, uh, uh, talk to me about the journey for your uh, direct customer. I mean, what is your direct customer? And then second is the customer's customer. So first, let's talk about the journey for the direct customer. Like say a, a company signs up for it. What next then? Do they have to create the templates uh, and the workflow steps and the stages? They, they have to define all of that. How does their onboarding happen? We figured that this is an area where people don't necessarily have like the maturity in a lot of companies to do this well on their own. So they do it in some way today. They have a checklist or they have a spreadsheet with some items that they're tracking. So we inspire them to build a beautiful template in Rocket Lane out of those spreadsheets that they carry. So we give them like a sample template, which they can modify and make their own. But we also give our inputs on it. And we also have a community. We have a 1,200 member community called Preflight a global community where people actually can share and ask questions and learn from each other as well. But we typically end up taking the customer's like checklist, turning it into a beautiful template for them. And we do that in a day just so that 
like they're having a better experience. They're not stuck in that step. And typically this is like one more thing that the customer is doing other than fighting customer buyers at their end. So we don't want them to get delayed with this step. So we say, you just give us your spreadsheet. We will do version one of your template. You take it from there and iterate on it. So we then give them the template. We also give them a playbook of how to evaluate rocket lane because it's not necessary that all of them already know what to expect from the product. It's a new kind of product. So we tell them, hey, there are a lot of things you want to get familiar with. And we give them a plan to go through that. So in a week, typically, some cases, even in three days, they come back and say, okay, I'm happy with what I see. I want to buy. And once they buy, then we start the proper onboarding where we do things like integrations with their CRM, integration with their help desk, if they need any other sort of things set up like custom fields in the project, custom fields on the tasks, migrating some of their existing projects into Rocket Lane. So we help them with all those activities. If it's a larger team, then we do training for them, which includes like, they're going to do a quiz for them. They're going to do a reverse demo for us. So we have a beautiful playbook, which we take them through. And the aim is they need to learn something on how to onboard customers from our experience onboarding them. Hmm. Got it. Okay. So your own onboarding serves as a benchmark for them that this is how you can use the tool. Right. Okay. Interesting. And so when you say that most companies have something on a spreadsheet as their onboarding checklist and you help them to make it more beautiful, what does that beautiful look like? Is it like a Kanban board or what does it look like? like? Yeah, it is going to be a board, but it's also going to be like they're going to help them give some themes and names to the different faces. They're going to help them explain their onboarding better to their customers saying, hey, week one, we're going to focus on configuration. Week two is going to be integrations with other systems. Week three is training and feedback. Week four is this. Right? So we're sort of going to help them craft it the right way. They're going to give them ideas on, hey, you know what? Looks like this is your usual problem. Migration is a big problem for you. So we suggest that in week one itself, you create this template for input for the migration. So like you can make like a Google form, you can embed forms within this for capturing information you need so that instead of sending an email with bullet points that please share this stuff, you can just select it. So the idea is to really help them with streamlining their onboarding and help them look more professional in front of their customers and de-risk their process by doing this the right way. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, interesting. And what is the client experience now? The customer's client. He'll get a magic link once he, say someone sends an inquiry to a company that, okay, I'm interested in getting this app built. Let's say I I want a food delivery app built and it's a software services company. What would be that client's experience in such a scenario? So the client's first brush with Rocket Lane typically would be on a call where they're asking about, hey, what happens after we buy? Or if we decide to engage, then what does the process look like? And then that time, our customer is going to use Rocket Lane to interactively walk them through the next few weeks or the next few months, right? So they're going to showcase the journey. And if this happens at a kickoff, or let's say this didn't happen before sale, but at kickoff, you're saying, okay, let me show you what the journey is going to be. Then that is where they also invite the customer and say, hey, by the way, what you saw is like our onboarding portal, our like delivery portal. And we're going to invite you to work with us on this portal so that we can hold each other accountable and we can have better visibility to how things are progressing and we can collaborate right here. So please see if you have this link from us where you're able to access this portal. And on that call, they access the portal. They have a beautiful view of the dashboard of what's spending and what's happening right now. What does the whole project look like? What are the documents that have been shared with them, including the kickoff deck and like requirements document and so on. So then that becomes a place where they will automatically come to to engage, ask a question, mark a task as getting done. And they're also going to get emails. And these emails have actionable buttons in them, which help the customer, customer's customer, just click from the email to say, I'm done with this and I'm blocked on this task and so on. Okay, amazing. So how does the customer see the, the journey, the roadmap? Is it like steps and showing that you are here? What is that landing page for the customer's client look like? Yeah, so it's going to look like 
it's a board view. It's like a Kanban, but each you have different faces as vertical columns. And things are either done in a face or still happening in a face. So you can see which got done, what not yet done. But to present it to the customer, there is a presentation mode that we've built. Because we built this for like client-facing projects. We said, hey, you want to present it? We will animate this journey for you. Oh, it's going to wow. come like face by face. You sort of walk them through what is their responsibility, what is your responsibility, what are the timelines. All of that shows up in a beautiful way. Amazing. Okay. <laughs> and... Oh. What is the pricing for this? How do you price it? We charge only for our customers, users, for their clients and customers, it's free. So if they have 10 people on the team, there is going to be 10 into $49 per month into 12 months. So 5,880 is what they will pay per year. And what is the minimum team size that you work with? If someone was to buy just a single seat? We kept our minimum as five because it's a collaborative product. We believe that even if you have three people in onboarding, you should give one more license to a product manager or some other team within the company. You should give one more license to probably the one of the founders who's involved in the customer side of things. Or maybe a sales head wants to see how what's happening with the accounts that they brought in. So we kept the minimum as five. Mm, okay, got it. So tell me from a timeline perspective that... Oh, when did you launch the product and how did you get the first 10 customers on it? Tell me about that journey from that zero to one journey. Sure. So the first thing I would say is we didn't launch one part of this. We launched the full product on day one. So it was not the typical MVP approach. We said this product, and, and we've seen this happen at Freshworks as well for certain categories. It makes more sense to build out the full thing and then launch it rather than try to start somewhere and then build up. And especially because you're not doing it for SMEs, you're doing it for enterprises. So you have only one chance to knock the door, so to say. And if they don't like it, then you can't knock that door again. Actually, a lot sense. of our customers are small companies. Their customers are enterprises and mid-market companies. So we even catch a lot of companies early. And that's part of our plan because then some of them grow really big with you. And that's a good thing to happen. Now, the way we got started, we did have this community already and we had some friends of Rocket Lane who were looking forward to the launch. But somehow... Yeah, and tell me about the community. You built that first and while you were building the product or like how did the yeah. community come about? We launched the community nine months before we launched the product. It was essentially... It started off with like, I was talking to this founder, a rock, a Nimesh from Rockmetric in Bombay. And he was telling me about how implementations used to be for him and how over the last four or five years, he's evolved it quite a bit. It's much tighter now and what all the tactics they're using for that. I said, hey, I think more people will be willing to listen to this. Can you share this with story of yours with more people? And he said, yes, yeah, sure. Happy to do it. Posted about this in like a SaaS boomy enterprise group. And people said, yes, we want to listen to the story. They all came together on a Zoom session. A lot of questions, a lot of activity. At the end of the session, I said, hey, I'm going to start this Slack group and I'll send you guys invites if you're interested, join. And then I made this a pattern. Every month, two sessions. And everyone who attends the session is added to the Slack group. And that's how the community started. Mm -hmm. and, and, and these are your target uh, audience whom you want to eventually sell it to. These would be like yes. PMs. Uh, Correct. These are delivery people. These are like onboarding specialists and so on. We then also started to reach out to people globally about it saying, hey, we have these kind of companies already in the community. You should also join. And people did join. And then it became like there was a snowballing effect. And we had some events that uh, we, like every month we do two events. So some events we already have a lot of attention. And we got featured on some blogs as top five customer success communities to join and whatnot. So all of that's given us like a fair amount of traction. Even today, our sales team, when we get on a call with the prospect, one of the first things they will talk about is to tell the company that, hey, whether or not you buy Rocket Lane, you should join our community because it's going to be like super valuable for you. And it's it also adds credibility to what we're doing. Okay. So did this community also help you build or you already had a fairly clear idea of what you want to build because of the fresh work experience? I mean, there are some conversations which gave us ideas and there are some people in the community, but we were already connected to them who we sort of pinged off and with like, hey, this is the direction we're taking. This is the idea. Give us feedback. Here's like a click through prototype. What do you think? We did use some 
connections from the community as part of like validation, but I wouldn't say it was a huge part of it. But we learned quite a lot about the space, about what's top of mind for people. So rather than one on one, it was definitely like a place from which we kept learning on a regular basis. There was like a learning through osmosis happening by Correct. interacting with these people because these are the people whose problems you're trying to solve. Correct. And for us to write the right kind of content and like, it's, it's also created so much content for us as a company. I actually write a series of tips on customer onboarding. I've done it like every Sunday for the last 15 Sundays. And I can keep going because there's infinite resources coming my way from the community. Yeah, every workshop or meetup, there would be questions people would be asking and those questions then become a content for you. Answering those questions right. becomes a source right. of content for you. Got it. Amazing. And which also would mean that your customer acquisition doesn't need to be through performance marketing or ads on Google, Facebook, but you already have this community for whom you're building and they would become the early adopters. Yes, we kept it as a no-sell zone for now. So we don't approach people over there and say, hey, do you want to try Rocket Lane? But I think people notice, right? So they know that, oh, Rocket Lane is a company that's running this. What is Rocket Lane? And it's a long game. It's not about getting our leads from day one from the community. But we believe when people are in the market for something, they will think of us. Okay. So when did you launch the product? June 23rd, 2021 was our launch. We did a product hunt launch plus our PR of our seed round on the same day sort of played into each other as well in a way. And we were number one on product hunt that day. So it turned out to be a very strong launch for us. And how much did you raise in the seed round? Three million. Okay. What kind of investors? Nexus and the Matrix partners were our early backers. But there was a group of other engines as well that we brought in. So this is by virtue of the network you would have built during the Freshworks days? I think not missing network bit at that time. But I think Girish has talked about the fresh chat story in different places. And in general, people knew us as a team because we had one exit before and we had a successful stint in tech fresh works. So people knew us. Of course, uh, Matrix, the partner, also happens to be a batchmate from IM Bangalore, who was like, hey, we should have invested in you last time. We missed out. This time we do want to definitely partner with you. Okay. So tell me about the, the numbers. So June 21, the product got launched. And how many customers did you onboard? Or how many seats did you have? Like month on month, how did that number grow? What is it today? Yeah, we, we haven't necessarily shared these numbers outside. But I can give you like a, a flavor of this. I think it's been pretty amazing traction for the first, even our first two months. We, we got so many customers that uh, first two months we got 30 paying customers. And that's not an easy thing to do. So, how many seats? Each one would be what, five, seven seats or like average? Yeah, I would say average would have been like probably close to 10 seats. But we did have a couple of customers. One had 300, one had... 150, 170, et cetera, as well in those first two months itself. So there's a few large ones in there who came in at the same time. The funniest thing is one of them, when they signed up, it was with a Gmail ID, right? And usually when we see leads with Gmail IDs, our salespeople are like, no, no, we should only collect business IDs. Why are we collecting Gmail IDs? They want to get, right? When I say our salespeople, I, I don't mean my sales team now, but from what I've seen at Freshworks as well, that turned out to be like one of our biggest deals. It's actually probably our biggest one right now. And these are like SaaS companies right now. You have not yet started doing that service company layer. We do have the one-off like management consulting company and marketing agency and so on. But I would say probably 96, 97% is going to be. Okay, okay. And like any numbers you can share, what you'll close this year at, like how many seats would you have or what's your target for next year? Like how many licenses? Not yet sharing, but we have, I think we're very ambitious on that front and it's, we have very strong momentum already, right? So it's the... What's your month on one growth? The last couple of months, last three months, I think we averaged upwards of 30% growth month on month and it's on a significant base already. So it's been growing. And what's your target? How many seats you want, like say end of this financial year or end of next financial year or anything that you have in mind as a milestone you want to hit? I think the like a good significant milestone to hit may be 
to get to, I would say, if the averaging, let's say 10, then maybe 500 customers will be like the next month. I don't know about when it could happen within the year, it could happen later, but that will be like a 5,000 seats of people using us will be a significant milestone for us. Okay. So what's your thought in terms of which is going to be a bigger market for you in the long run? Like the SaaS companies who are onboarding or the service companies who are using it for project management? If you ask me today, it has to be the service companies. But then SaaS is growing in such a way that we can't tell. Maybe to be a substantial part as well. And because our messaging is optimized for that today, we may continue to have a bigger pie in that. But if you just purely ask, purely market size, services is bigger. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you're right that to really tap that, it's a much bigger market. And to really tap it, you may need to, I don't know, have an alternate brand name or something to get them in and have a different strategy for that segment. Because they may not feel that this is the product for me by looking at a product which is talking to SaaS companies and maybe you'd need like a completely different type of communication for them. Maybe okay. even your onboarding would need to be less manual. Like right now your onboarding, is, it's a high touch onboarding, right? That okay. also maybe you would need to, is that something in your roadmap to do that? Yes. So we do have plans of how to redo our website and messaging so that people know that hey, there is rocket lane for onboarding for SaaS. There is a rocket lane for marketing agencies. There is rocket lane for consulting companies, like the solution-based approach to our marketing. So that's something that we will do. And also, as you said, we actually opened up the product for people to sign up and start using it on their own in a couple of weeks ago. So when we did our most recent funding announcement, I, I don't know if you saw the rap video that we put out as well with it. No, I did. <laughs> Okay. It has over uh, 120,000 views now and it's growing. But we sort of did this fun thing to grab attention of people, but it came on TV in the US and so on. So it's been exciting for us. But it's about when we did this announcement, we also made sure that people can sign up and start using the product on their own. And we then identify which ones need help and do a more high touch onboarding for certain customers, but not all of them need that sort of high touch from us. So when you say you open it up for self-service, like you say you give them like a 15-day trial? Or That's right. Got it. Okay. No. Did you rap in this rap video or what was this rap video about? I did not. We have a content marketer who sort of told the story of Rocket Lane so far. Okay. Okay. Amazing. Okay. Yeah, I guess your approach is like a content first approach to get customers, like Content and community rather than the traditional approach of performance marketing. Do you spend anything on performance marketing? We do. We have started some experiments because I think from a predictability angle, it's a good thing to have that working. It's also a drug, so we don't want to rely on it. But at the same time, I think, yeah, we're definitely very content oriented as a team, brand and content, I would say. And we want to be seen as the thought leader in the space because we have the opportunity to be a true global leader, which is, it, it's not easy to have that happen for you. And we actually, I don't know how long it usually takes people, but for us, we became a leader in G2 in the category of client onboarding within our first six months of launch. And I think that's like a significant sort of milestone as a SaaS company. Are there competitors, like someone who's doing what you're doing? Yeah, there are a few people who are also doing similar, but as you would expect in any new category, it's not apples to apples, right? So there's similarities, but there's also differences in approach. I would say our biggest USP is how holistic this, it, it puts everything together in one experience. It's a very unified experience driven approach and it's probably the most robust solution out there given the breadth and depth that we've gotten to in a quick time. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, do you have any big competitors or, or they're all like no. early stage? All are early stage. Oh, okay. Got it. Okay. And so I want to understand how SaaS companies figure out pricing. Like you have a pricing of $49. How, how did you figure out that? Okay, let's price it at this. Yeah, I, I think one is you've seen what people are comfortable paying for like software like this from the Freshworks journey. We're not necessarily pegging it to ROI in a way in which we want to extract the most out of a customer today. More taken an approach of it needs to be an easy decision for someone to buy. We've also looked at what others are doing in this space. 
like if you look at asana how is asana charging and we are better than asana for this use case so we can charge a little more right so that's one more thing we looked at and i know we're probably leaving some value on the table today but that's okay we are optimizing for momentum right now rather than like specific dollar numbers and maximizing what we get from customers okay okay but asana is like maybe one third or one fourth of what you are charging right not really for each of the tiers it would be for one tier it may be half but in the other one it may be we are charging 20 dollars more etc and yeah i think but we can show a 10x better experience than an asana for their customers so that's like an important thing for us to say okay we are better let's charge more right right and how do you treat a discounting and again i'm talking as advice for a saas founder on how to look at discounting should one give discounts for volume deals or should it be just a flat transparent pricing and this is it take it or leave it okay. i think i'm going to share some secrets from our side for this question specific discounting i think early days it's okay to discount definitely i would also say depending on the market so we are a pretty popular team in india a lot of people know us because like i've been a volunteer on this whole saas boomi thing and so on so people know us and check us out and we know that india pricing may need discounts from time to time and very early stage companies if you're bootstrapped and so on we will offer discounts over there as well so we made it like do you qualify for a discount or not has some condition fresh looks has a startup plan where they offer discounts to startups mm-hmm. correct they give like free credits we don't do that but we make it a no brainer for a early stage startup to say okay i want to buy a rocket lane for a year it should be like a easy decision for them so that we do and for those who are funded and so on if they're buying a huge number of licenses we do give them benefits of that volume and we want to make them also feel like especially as early customers that they're benefiting from they're taking a bet on us and we're giving them something back in return but the one condition i usually have and this is what i was talking about as a strict rate is like if you're giving a discount you need to take something back from the customer it could be that they're giving you like a longer term if they're looking for a discount it needs to be necessarily at least annual but guess what if you can lock them in for two years even better if they're giving a discount i need a video testimonial from them yeah they're giving a discount they need to support you with doing ref checks with other customers so you like the product you're buying it now we are helping you to make it fit your budget you need to help us in return with some other things if you like the founder thesis podcast then do check out our other shows on subjects like marketing technology career advice books and drama visit the podium.in that is t h e p o d i u m dot i n for a complete list of all our shows.